Good morning. So nothing says the future of retail and innovation like PowerPoint. <laughs> that irony is not lost on me. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, so it sounds really, really formal, and it is. I spend all day, every day, researching. Uh, I live in Silicon Valley, and it's kind of hard not to uh, find whatever's going to be disruptive, whether you go to the coffee shop or the supermarket. But what's really important is that somewhere along the way, I don't know if you caught that, but I had to become an anthropologist. And that was because disruptive technology is accelerating to the point where even I can't keep up with it. But the thing that is slower and probably more important is the effect that disruptive technology has on society, on executives, on businesses, on customers, on families, friends. And understanding that is actually when technology comes alive when you understand why technology is important, where it's going, and then more so how to use it to your advantage. So I'm gonna share with you some of the things that, I don't know, inspire me as a way of hope, hopefully driving you to see new opportunities. Because change is hard, that's, that's just a reality. But what's harder is actually not knowing what to do next or why it matters. And that's why I'm here. Because change is inevitable. It's going to happen. How perfect is that, right? That's no Photoshop. <laughs> and what you see, though, is a common pattern, right? There's, there's, there's blockbuster, there's borders. And in hindsight, when you look at their competitors, when disruption came out of nowhere, when they took off and the other ones didn't, you can always reverse engineer that, and you can see that years before that moment that something happened at the executive level where they just did not see or appreciate or maybe understand just how fundamentally different their customers were and were becoming. Right? And I don't know if you know the story, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a favorite of mine that Netflix, you know, <laughs> before they overtook Blockbuster in the consumer video market, Reed Hastings was a blockbuster customer. He's the founding CEO of Netflix. And he got the idea for Netflix after being charged a $40 late fee for Apollo 13. Could you imagine that moment where the clerk sealed the fate of blockbuster <laughs> by, by assessing that late charge? And I guess the point of that story is that disruption, it comes from anywhere, right? I mean, I'm sure you'll hear or have heard many, many times the Uber example, right? I mean. Uber came out of nowhere and is affecting the taxi industry all around the world, but it's not like it was overnight. It was progressive and it accelerated when customers' demands and expectations just started to change and the industries didn't change along with it. So what I want to do is share with you some of the top trends in technology, in people, and in markets to just kind of open your horizons and get you thinking. We'll have Q&A. You'll get to hear other great speakers as well. But what, the way I like to look at things, especially living in Silicon Valley, is that innovation is not necessarily something that starts with technology. Technology will solve some of your problems, but only because it has a purpose. And that purpose is always driven by perspective. And that's where true innovation begins, is what does the future look like? What if you had a blank slate? What if you understood people so well that you could reimagine what the retail experience is and what could it be? Or online experience, or the customer journey, or just seeing the world through their eyes, or more importantly, through their screens, and then making decisions based on that view. So I'll make sure that you get a copy of this deck because there are, I think, another 60 slides or so. I just stuffed so much research into this and I organized it into 10 common themes. So the idea of customer behavior and expectations changing isn't new, right? It's just, it's always happened. But as Chad said, you're, you're faced with two generations that are fundamentally different than, than most of us. Right, so we all hear about the millennials, how they shop and how they work are different than us. But it's not because they want to be difficult, it's simply because it is how technology affected society and society changed and evolved, and it changed so radically that their value systems, their core of who they are, 
is different than the generations before. And then you look at the centennials after them, and they're radically different than the millennials. It's all good, as long as we understand that perspective is actually where innovation begins. So now that means that processes and systems and even perspectives and philosophies of how we think about marketing and sales has to change along with all of this stuff. And it all begins with empathy. And empathy is something that is different than sympathy. And empathy is the very thing that allows us to feel how someone else goes through the journey. Because when you feel it, it's really inspiring. I don't know if you watched the show Undercover Boss, but I call it the Undercover Boss moment. And I love that show, even though it has the same exact ending every episode, <laughs> because there's that moment where an executive sees things differently and they say, I forgot what it was like to be a customer, I forgot what it was like to be an employee. And that's when the magic happens, right? And it's that gift of empathy that we all kind of need, to see things differently and appreciate it. But everything in what you do and how you sell and how you market can be reinvented and should be reinvented. And yes, it's hard and like, oh my gosh, he's giving me too much work to do when he leaves here. But when I study customers, whether it's B2B, B2C, B2B2C, finance, retail, health, the common theme is that it's just they see the world differently. They go through the world differently. And what happens is things like this. We take for granted all that we know. We take for granted all of the things that brought us to this moment, and it kind of just psychologically gets in the way of being able to see where we can innovate. So things like this, it just blows me away that no one at Microsoft has figured out that it's time to retire the save icon, right? Because half this room knows a floppy disk, right? Oh, it makes sense, that's why I clicked that. And the other half of this room actually thinks that's a save icon. If we saw the world through the lens of the people who think it's a save icon, we would realize that, whoa, many things we take for granted in life are already outdated. So when those worlds come together, hey, ever see one of these before? Oh, you made a 3D print out of the save icon. <laughs> so great. <laughs> and so I break, I break it down that way, is that there's just two, two mindsets, those who know that that's a floppy disk and those who think it's a save icon. But this is the world in which we live, right? Some of us look at this and say, when, when you go to a concert, put the phone down, enjoy the moment. And everyone else who has their phone up says, we are enjoying the moment. And we're sharing it with our thousand friends on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Periscope or you name it, Snapchat. And I guess that's the magic of it, right? Is that we, we tend to judge it when we just have to appreciate it. But here's why it is a bigger deal than I think we can, well, before I knew. It's not just the millennials and it's not just the centennials. It's your entire connected customer base. And in my research, I found several years ago something that just completely blew me away is that if you have a smartphone, say an iPhone or an Android, and let's say you're active on any one of those social networks, let's say you use Uber and you use some of these apps like Instacart, you start to act like a millennial. Whether you're 55, 45, or 65, you start exhibiting the same types of decision-making behaviors as younger kids and young adults. And so when I figured that out, I had to classify it as not a demographic, but as a psychographic. I called it Generation C, where the C was connected. So Generation Connected, that if you live a connected lifestyle, how you go throughout the customer journey how you align with brands, what makes you make a decision, the value systems that you have, they're all pretty similar. So that means that your customer base is getting increasingly connected, much more influential, much more important than just anything that's generational. And it's getting bigger every single day. <laughs> Some of you, I'm sure, are parents. I'm a parent. and. The one thing when we see a picture like this, it's like, this is exactly what's wrong with the world today. No one, no one can look up. Everybody speaks in emojis. But <laughs> the reality is it's probably, to them, the best party ever, right? And they're probably telling each other that right in that moment. 
this is the best party ever, right? I know, let's take a selfie. But <laughs> so what I try to do is I take these moments and try to figure out what, what would it take to reverse engineer what's so important on that screen? Because it's not just them, right? It's everybody. I, I did a lot of work with m magazine publishers and <laughs> even famous gum brands to figure out what was happening in the impulse buy moment, why they were losing a ton of sales. And I walked into one store and just took this picture and said, it might have something to do with this. Phones, right? People are so involved in these digital worlds that they do forget to look up and they do miss a lot of the marketing that used to work, a lot of the impulse strategies that used to work, a lot of uh, what P&G used to call the first moment of truth strategies. Doesn't mean it's the end of the world, it just means what do we do with technology to bring them back into the moment? And so it's just sort of learning the art of what's so fascinating to someone on those screens in order to be able to make a connection through those screens. It's not impossible, but it does take empathy and appreciation because I think that if we use the phone as a metaphor, we actually get to see what life could be like through a new lens. This is an app, by the way, it's hilarious. It's, it's called Text and Walk, and it turns your camera on so you can safely navigate the streets or aisles. <laughs> You know what's funny is that it's actually not the most popular app because it's actually hard to keep your arms up while you're walking. It's easier to do this. But I use it as a metaphor to see, see the world differently, right? And to see that the thing about the phone that is so transformative is, is not just because it's a crazy cool device. It is actually teaching us and conditioning us as customers, as human beings, that the world literally revolves around us. If you share something on one of the social networks, you will get responses. If you need a car, there's an app for that. There's an app for everything. And so now what we're starting to learn, for example, with Amazon and Google Express, is that within minutes or within an hour, you can have whatever it is that you want at your front door or wherever you are. So the world is really starting to revolve around us. And that's what makes it hard, is that once you start to be conditioned, you start to get spoiled. And once you get spoiled, then your expectations now shift that you expect every single company, regardless of what industry you're in, to start behaving and acting just like their favorite apps. And so what we start to do now is look at data differently. Not just what are people doing, but what's in between the ones and zeros that allow us to see how we could be of value, right? Otherwise, if we don't figure out how to be a value based on expectations and how people are changing and how people are expecting things differently, we start to react, right? And when we start to react, it's kind of late. What we have to do is get ahead of all of this. So you have things like beacons and sensors and augmented reality and all this stuff that's going to start flooding the market. And we're going to, if we react, we're going to bury ourselves with technology options when we have to actually say, well, what is the experience people want? So that leads us to another trend, which is if the world is revolving around us, what does that mean? Well, it means that on demand, they call it the on demand economy because now Everything is becoming the Uber of, right? You want something, you get it, right? We call it instant gratification. And if, if you can imagine it, there's going to be an app that brings you whatever it is that you want. But more so, now technology is starting to create bridges to get you whatever you want, whenever you want it. Amazon Echo, for example, is one, it's actually one crazy way of thinking about innovation, which was we all thought back when we heard rumors that Amazon was putting the speaker together that it was going to be a competitor to Sonos, which is an indoor, in-house wireless speaker system. And it is, but the brilliance of it is actually the artificial intelligence built into what we call Alexa is to help you shop more at Amazon. And it's super intelligent. And when you pair it with your app, it makes shopping frictionless. It actually makes it so frictionless that it's a little bit weird by talking to this little cylinder. That will, so I have one in my house. Say, Alexa, please reorder dog food because I was randomly watching a commercial on TV at that moment. And she comes on and says, you want the same order? Yes, 
boom, two days later I got my dog food, I didn't even have to leave the couch. The on-demand economy starts to now change, that becomes the standard, so what's next? Why should I wait two days for it? That's too long. And so you're hearing about drones and you're hearing about Uber drivers becoming delivery uh, logistics companies. In fact, there's a whole strategy that Amazon has that where they're getting approval. They're laying out their, their strategy for drones to deliver stuff to you now. We all thought it was a joke at the beginning, but no. But now there's companies like Postmates, which is essentially the Uber of delivery that a lot of retailers are partnering with so that if you want your order, whatever it is that you're shopping for in an hour, well, then you can do this. And what's interesting about it is that companies like Starbucks, for example, have partnered with Postmates because, well, why wait in line? And Uber, right? Uber has a lot of drivers within its networks that are sometimes idle. So why sit around waiting for rides when they can start making deliveries? And so these partnerships that are forging are coming out of nowhere and they start to build momentum. And when they build momentum, that's when expectations continue to change. And so tracking all of these things and figuring out ways to implement them is just one way to understand how the customer is changing, but it's also a magnificent time to rethink what it is we do and how it is that we can be relevant moving forward. Because I think what it really comes down to is this idea of the customer experience, and I study this relentlessly. The customer experience is really, it's really big because we tend to look at it based on the infrastructures that we have today that support the customer experience. And depending on who you talk to, customer experience could be related to customer service or customer support or net promoter score. But all it really is, is an emotion. The customer experience is an emotion, right? It's a reaction to whatever they're dealing with. And it's not just one moment, it's every moment of the shopping journey. So it's basically throughout a life cycle, and that customer experience is the sum of all of those engagements, all of those moments. And so really competing for the customer experience moving forward means that we have to rethink what the shopper's journey really is and market and sell and serve to it in a way that they're expecting or maybe in a way that they don't expect because that's the magic, right? In fact, data shows that any company, whether you're CPG, whether you're retail, whether you make cars, the competitive advantage for the immediate future, like say the next five years, is going to be customer experience. Not just products, not just services, but the overall experience becomes a competitive advantage. So now that means what comes to life inside the building? What's different about online? How do these things weave together. And there's great examples of this already starting to come up. I mean, you might see them from a technology standpoint. So-and-so uses beacons. So-and-so uses Apple Pay. But more so, and this is the hard part, but this is also the transformative part. This is where you start to just outpace everyone, is when you rethink how all of those technologies could be used to deliver a better customer experience. And there are companies that aren't looking at their competitors for this. Because if they do, then they're not going to be terribly inspired. They look at other industries, right? A lot, of, a lot of companies that I work with that are in completely traditional spaces look at video gaming companies, look at consumer electronics companies as a way of figuring out, well, how are they engaging their customer? How are they creating better experiences? Things as simple as services, too. This doesn't even have to be about technology, but the on-demand economy is now starting to get customers to expect, well, I should have free shipping. If I don't like it, I should have free shipping back. Make it easier for me. And the weird thing about it is that a lot of companies say, well, I don't want to pay for shipping both ways. You should pay for shipping. Otherwise, I'm gonna, you're going to erode my margins. Yet the odd thing that happens as a result is that customers are more loyal to these companies. They shop more with these companies. They actually tend to pay more without really caring because they know they're going to get a good experience. And then that pattern continues throughout every industry. If they know they're going to get a better customer experience, they'll pay upwards of 25% more 
for a product. But that's not it as well, right? Customer experience is all the way through loyalty and advocacy. And the whole idea of loyalty is also being reimagined. What does the customer value? Well, this is what makes it hard. But it's also, again, a wonderful time, a wonderful opportunity for us to be innovative, which is, well, we have customers who still value things the way they were. But we can't apply that to everybody. So understanding the value system for rewards and points and all of these things now start to tell us that based on all the data that we can collect with all these technologies and the data groups that maybe you start to assign around these programs, you realize that what they value and what they want is trackable in order to introduce what loyalty could be what could be a value, not just because it's an app and it's tracking your sales, but it's actually giving you things that matter. Do you know that a lot of folks will pay with their smartphones because they, they expect loyalty-based programs to just happen frictionlessly? And I think that is an area of opportunity for all of us, is to understand what are those connections, because payments, like the save icon, we just sort of take for granted. It's a transaction, it's a quick moment. But mobile is quickly becoming the wallet. And as a result, it's opening up doors to ways to bring life into those moments, those transactions. For example, uh, I've, I've, I've done a lot of work with the, um, the executive team at Starbucks. And one of the things that I've learned was that their mobile strategy was very specific, that they were learning about people through payments, through mobile behaviors, as a way of actually reimagining the whole experience, even the retail experience. But phones is just the beginning. I'm sure some of you have the Apple Watch. I have the Apple Watch. It just now starts to completely reimagine the journey when I, all I have to do is this. But every single aspect of that changes expectations and also the dynamics of what's possible. Not just when I'm paying, not just when I'm shopping, but also well, what, what's the checkout experience like? Why stand in line? What else can happen in those moments? Could I just pay for it myself like the self-checkout counters? Well, the answer is yeah, of course. And the more that we start to build these apps or integrate into apps that already exist, the more we start to actually create a community of customers that doesn't have to happen or matter just in those moments, all the data, all the insights, all the relationships that we have actually forms a back end that we can mine, that we can understand, that we could actually appreciate in order to deliver value after those transactions. But now also, there's social media. Right? And social media I think is pretty interesting <laughs> for a lot of reasons beyond selfies. The biggest thing is Social is its own internet, right? I mean, I'm sure most of you in the room use Facebook, but at, I don't know if you realize, but Facebook is becoming like the new AOL. Not because it spams your house with CD-ROMs, but <laughs> because it is an encapsulated experience. And if you, if you watch close enough and you look at their announcements for media and television and video and news partnerships that they're forging, they don't want you to leave Facebook. So the more they can keep you in there, the more they can sell ads, the more they can sell mobile ads, and now the more that they can actually start to sell you stuff. And now Facebook and every social network out there is experimenting with, with buy buttons, helping companies connect to people in the moment because the thing about social networks that's so incredible is that there's so much context you know who they are based on their friends and based on their likes and based on their associations and all that data is available. Facebook sells it, they all sell it. And this quote from Mark Zuckerberg from several years ago when he was asked, what's gonna be the next big thing for Facebook? And he said, if I had to guess, it's gonna be social commerce. It's gonna be social commerce that's the next thing to blow up. And as a result, you start seeing every network start to figure out social commerce. And I gotta, I gotta tell you, having experimented with it from a customer standpoint, 
and knowing that the back end is allowing for seamless delivery and payments, it's very cool. <laughs> it's making me very lazy. But I don't know if you've seen that Pixar movie, <laughs> WALL-E, where they're all on that cruise ship and everybody's on the chase lounges and no one ever gets up. It's sort of, <laughs> sort of weird like that, but it's happening. But that builds trust, right? All of these types of engagements, not just with the retail experience, not just with the shopping experience, but think about how all of these customers are using these apps and these services. The one thing that connects them are other people. And this is why social media became new media, was because it built a trust economy inside of there. And then the trust economy became the thing that other people believe is important when they're making decisions, not just what's on the website or not just what the manufacturer says, and bringing people together so that they could inspire one another in those moments of truth is becoming something beyond trust. It's actually becoming the new shopper journey. And by the way, this has every industry freaking out because transparency wasn't something that was part of business. <laughs> Just ask any, any car dealer. But the truth is, is that now it's expected, and I do a lot of work with Google around what is driving someone when they go into the journey? What's the search question? It's not a term, it's usually a question. And what comes back? And what comes back is usually a ton of YouTube videos that they'll watch, review sites that they'll go to, and they'll start reading or watching what other people think. And so implementing these types of communities are really important. The other thing to realize is this, and this is why, again, this is a magnificent opportunity for all of us. Change, in this case, is really good. We all have to compete regardless of stature because the new customer is now much more informed and less susceptible to marketing, like traditional marketing, than some of us were. When a smartphone user, and I'm being very specific about the smartphone customer rather than just any customer, because data shows that the smartphone customer is just a different breed, right? But I want to make it clear that every day the smartphone customer is becoming a bigger and bigger, bigger customer set. Because they're not necessarily committed to a brand when they go into the journey. They're looking for information and the trust economy is basically the information that is supplied to help someone make a journey, not because the marketer or the business said this is what you should buy, it's because someone else said this is what you should buy based on the experience that they had with that. And so they're looking for relevant information, useful information, not just websites, not just what clever marketing snippets were able to put on the box or online. They are looking for experiences. What did someone think? What did someone do? And not just aggregating reviews, but becoming part of the trust economy is a real big opportunity for everybody, for retailers, e-tailers, manufacturers, everybody. So it's a different mindset though. It's, it's, it's really customer driven, customer centric. So for example, Birchbox is this um, sort of startup. It's a very successful startup, but they have been compared, they sell, they sell beauty goods, they sell lifestyle goods, they're totally an e-commerce play. But they've been compared to Cosmo and GQ in terms of the style tips and the buyer's guides that they put together. They, you would swear you were reading a magazine when you go to their site. And it's not just about here's the product, it's like here's the moment, right? Let's say you're serving dinner, let's say you're having friends over for cocktails, let's say you're serving brunch. And then the products that they feature in that are all not just how-tos, but how to bring this moment to life. And it is influencing decisions a lot differently, but now it's also part of this trust economy. As the seller and as the marketer, you don't have to just leave it up to chance for what other people are gonna say and do or create. That's part of it, right? User-generated content is a big part of, of, of the trust economy, but you can be part of the trust economy and how you create content. So earlier when we were talking about the on-demand economy, I know all these different economies, but the on-demand economy and the trust economy, 
and how it's conditioning people to think differently. Well, it's conditioning them to have expectations like this. Well, I shop at Birchbox and they create these videos for me. Why, why wouldn't you? And it works. The stats around this type of content to help people make decisions show you that your sales skyrocket to the point where you start to see them in random places. I know that Birchbox, and this is such a random connection, inspired us uh, an online warehouse catalog company called CJ Pony Parts. Which, for those guys who like Mustangs in the room and gals that like Mustangs in the room, know that that's where you buy your stuff. And every product that they sell has a video with this, these duos that come up online and show you how to do this and tell you why it's important. And like, you make decisions based on that because who has time to read anymore? <laughs> I say that jokingly, but I'm kind of serious at the same time. Video is sort of spoiling us, which I don't know if you know this stat, but YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. And you think, what? what? It's a video for cat it's a site for cat videos and Justin Bieber videos and people use it to look for videos, how to do something. I mean, when's the last time you read a how-to manual for something that you set up? You go to YouTube because someone else did that for you. And the same thing is true from helping people make decisions. Another area of what I call the save icon moment is the receipt. You know, the whole thing about the receipt, another trend that's happening behind the scenes is it's actually a way for you to continue the experience. It's not just here's a record of your transaction. Here is more about the products that you just got, rethinking the whole CRM system, feeding into it electronically. Uh, I've seen coffee chains use the receipt of telling you the story of the, where the coffee came from, how to brew it when you get home, the best ways to enjoy it. But more so, it can open up a channel for you to continue the dialogue. In fact, if you take this example and kind of get blown away, manufacturers and the things that they're selling are trying to usurp your CRM. I don't know if you know this or not. It's called in-product communication. And so I see the receipt as being sort of a way to reimagine the relationship after the transaction to compete against what's about to happen, which is in-product communication is part of the whole internet of things phenomenon that's happening. So for example, if you have a printer at home and it's connected to your Wi-Fi, your printer is going to be able to communicate to the manufacturer when it's low on ink, when it needs service, when you need paper, and they're going to be able to communicate back through the printer screen, click here to order direct. And it's a very, very interesting approach, seamless for the customer, much like the Amazon Echo. But for us, it gives us a new opportunity to think about, well, how would you compete with that? How would you be the first to build a relationship beyond not just the receipt, but also what's the value that keeps those relationships alive? So I know some of you have heard of, of showrooming, which is the phenomenon when somebody goes into a store, pulls out their phone, and starts shopping for it on Amazon to see if they can save money. And this was a big deal for companies like Best Buy, for example, that were losing sales to Amazon. And I remember back in the day, because I kind of did it too, asking a manager if they could just match the prices. And they said, no, well, that's not our policy. We only, uh, we only use uh, printed competitor pricing to match. I said, oh, well, I could print this site and you could match it. No, we don't do that. They do it now. Target also does it now. A lot of retailers do it now. But the whole point was that they were missing the point, which was this was happening and they were losing relationships in the process. And it took them a while to react. And they were able to make up for it because another interesting phenomenon started to happen along the way, which is called web rooming. This is where people go online to search, go to Amazon to read the reviews, go to YouTube to watch the videos to make a decision about what they want because the on-demand economy for all these other apps that exist is starting to retrain people to not wait for Amazon, but to go into the store and go get it now or have a service, bring it to them now. So they're reverse showrooming. 
and it's phenomenal. In fact, millennials prefer web rooming. It allows them to do all that research. It allows them to get the product number. It allows them to get the product now. And as a result, now Amazon was winning with showrooming, but now Amazon is having to come back and realize, oh my gosh, we're losing in these moments. How do we compete? Hence drones, hence partnerships with Uber so that they can get the product to your on-demand customer right then and there. But there's a lot of reasons behind this. All of them are just driven by the conditioning that's happening with all of these other technologies out there. So understanding this gives us ways that we can think about innovation in services and using technology to bring things to life differently, because it's only getting crazier. I, uh, I study this quite a bit, and so some of the things that I'm privy to in terms of what is going to be the future of the shelf, for example, or the supply chain, or inventory, there are so many startups that are getting funded to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars to figure this out. And some of the big companies are starting to react in interesting ways. For example, uh, Lowe's literally just announced on the 29th of October that they're going to launch a commercial 3D printer into the space so that they can create stuff without having to stock stuff. So if you need parts, if you need certain things that are difficult to store or find, you just go into Lowe's and you print it, which is so crazy because on the immediate horizon, you're going to be able to do that at home. So maybe you don't need to go to the store. You can just download a, a blueprint and print it at home. GE, for example, does this with a lot of their engines, their jet engines. So when they're making these engines, there are certain parts that are very difficult to get. And they recognize that it was so expensive to get these parts that they just reinvented their supply chain in certain aspects and started 3D printing those parts. But then there's beacons. And beacons, I think, are, I mean, I don't know about you. There's that whole minority report thing where people get creeped out around privacy issues. Like, oh, hey, what, Brian, how do you know I'm here? How do you know that's what I bought? Ah. You know, so there's a freaky line, as we call it. And the good news is, and I know this is debatable, but trust me on this. The good news is, is that people redefine privacy different than a lot of us, right? And as long as the line isn't crossed, and as long as we, underappreci we appreciate where the line is, we can get right up against it and do some really amazing things. And people are telling you they actually want you to do really amazing things. Like, if you start to learn about the things that I buy, like Amazon Echo and Amazon, know what I buy and what I like. It knows what to push to me through the app. So beacons can be the same thing. You can push notifications about sales based on not only what they buy, but where they are in the store. You can push price comparisons when they're standing in a place for a certain amount of time to say, can I help you by showing you a few things? As long as it's contextually relevant, and as long as it's tied to value, even loyalty and payments without even having to go to a counter, Beacon becomes a marketing and sales strategy. And it allows you to do so much more to like understand traffic and brand affinities and favorite products and who they are and what they like and service and my goodness, the list goes on and on. And by the way, when you get this deck, there's a whole bunch of slides you're not even seeing that are gonna help tell you a bunch of, a bunch of stuff to do forward. But this is not unlike what Disney's doing with the Magic Band. And if you're following what Disney's doing with the Magic Band, Again, you look to other sectin, sectors to inspire how, what you could do differently. Disney's investing billions of dollars in the Magic Band to do just this, right? You wear this band because it opens your hotel door, because you can pay with it in Disney restaurants and in Disney stores. It uh, allows you to get in and out of the park. It allows you to get your fast track all on this little band. And to the customer, it's just beautiful, it's a beautiful seamless experience, but to Disney, they're learning everything. And they're taking all of that data and they're applying it back to how to make the park frictionless. Can we take out turnstiles everywhere? Can we improve the experience for someone when they come into a restaurant? And for example, 
if you make reservations on the app for a certain place, that restaurant knows when you are in the proximity they know when you walk in, there's a sign that greets you because you, you just told them who you were. And while that's getting really close to the freaky line, people are like, oh my gosh, Disney knows me, they love me. <laughs> it's magical. And so I guess it's all just based on intention. So I would say that beacons, when you look at beacons, I would look at how Disney's using them to inspire new experiences. But also there's a store in Sydney, Australia that is run by a company called Telstra, which is the equivalent of, of AT&T in Australia. And you should look up their flagship Sydney store and what they're doing with beacons. It's very, very, very cool. But now, the retail experience, of which we hear all the time about magic mirrors, smart mirrors, smart walls, yes, they're all coming. And I'm sure some of you are going to buy them. But it's also very shocking at who's funding them. And not shocking, but just revealing because it starts to show you where things are going. PayPal is starting to invest in a lot of these technologies because they want you to be able to avoid the clerk. And they want to be able to be the bridge that handles the payment, the financial transaction. So if they can give you the technology that makes a better experience for whether you're trying on clothes, learning more things, or trying on whatever, or sampling, like for example at Telstra, there's this big, big, big table that is super smart. So you can put one phone on the table and another phone on the table and up comes this minority report experience where you see the features and comparisons between the two and you can move them around and move phones and it's really, really cool. But imagine then right there if I just hit buy now. And that's what we're starting to see. But at the same time, we're starting to see like, well, you can carry more products because you don't have to carry all of the inventory. Or we can customize things where in an hour we can have it shipped from a warehouse to your house. And so this is where I think the future now starts to come together for all of us. And this is true for any kind of business, is reimagining what the customer journey really is. And first, finding where there's friction today, and that's where everybody should start. And then thinking about, well, what's possible in terms of innovation? What technologies are being used elsewhere, like Disney, for example, and what can we do that reimagines the customer journey? Because there's the way we see it, and then there's the way that customers go through it. And here's one of the things that's really interesting to me. Uh, it's both a threat and an opportunity. Is that because of things like Uber and because of things like Instacart and because of things like Tinder, the dating app, all kinds of crazy things, customers are now starting to expect their journey, their experience with anybody to be seamless like this. Right? Not just on demand, but in how they interact and go through the journey. And anything that's sort of met with friction along that way is first, not cool. Second, it's now starting to feel unnatural. Right? So the hoops that we've put out for the customer journey, the way they follow it, when they come into the store, when they're not in the store, when they're online, they're old. And they're starting to feel old. And when they feel old, you now, as a customer, are open to disruption which is why things like Birchbox, which is why all of these startups that are coming out of nowhere are really starting to get traction because they're catering to people the way they want to deal with things, right? Because they understand that. And so if you go through the customer journey, whether you're a traditional customer or whether you're a highly connected customer, you realize that it's just, it's just broken because it was built many years ago upon legacy philosophies and standards and systems and technologies, and then every time something new came around, we just sort of built on top of that. When in fact, some of these startups that are coming out of nowhere and winning is because they're starting from scratch, which is good for them, right? But the reason that they're able to do so is because they're looking at customers differently. When you look at your journeys from an empathetic point of view, walking in the shoes of your customers, you recognize that almost all of them have to switch devices or channels to be able to finish the journey. And while that's worked up until now, it's not gonna work much longer because it's, it's complicated, right? So you look at how big, big, big companies are spending billions of dollars 
to invest in what's, well, that's a buzzword, omni-channel. But what omni-channel really means is, well, how, how do I complete my journey on one device? And how do all those groups that run the website, that run e-tail e-commerce, that run payments, that run social media, that run mobile, how do all these groups now start to work together so the experience is seamless, but also value added?